So welcome to the MedTech 20, Lara. It's really great to have you on the show. We're super happy to uh, hear a little bit more about the Improve Well business. Um, you know, a lot of people probably won't uh, be super familiar with it. So uh, really, really happy to give you kind of a platform to talk a little bit about that. So welcome to the program. Thanks very much for having me, Gordon. It's a pleasure to be here today. Okay, so for those of us out there who may not be super familiar with Improve Well, maybe you could share a little bit about uh, some of the background of the business, um, what, what you kind of actually offer to the market, and uh, yeah, maybe we can start there. Sure. So um, Improve Well is the purpose-built engagement solution for improvement in healthcare. So that's how we describe ourselves. Essentially, it's a smartphone app for anybody working on the front line to share their ideas for improvement and they can complete um, pulse surveys and they can also share how their day at work is going. And then we have a real time data dashboard that allows group and organizational leads to capture that real time feedback every single day from the front line, spot trends and pressure points, and then ultimately make better decisions uh, based on those real time insights. So our mission is to empower a workforce of 1.7 million across the NHS to improve the way that care is delivered. And that's that's really how this all started. And I'm more than happy to go into more detail on that as well. So it's it's a, uh, on your mobile phone, it's an app. And it, does it communicate amongst peers as well as kind of giving that data to... Uh, it can do. Okay. Yes, yes. So it's a smartphone app available on iOS, Android and the web. So multi-platform the way that the different groups use it is entirely up to them. So um, it empowers kind of departmental, um, organizational, even sort of trust wide or even regional programs. You can set, make the settings so it's very sort of process focused. So give me your feedback. This is what's going to happen. We're going to review it and, and it's going to move on to the next stage. Or it might be a team might make it very social so that everybody sees everything and everyone can comment and collaborate. So it really depends on the dynamics of the individual user groups. But the way that we built the tool is so that it's scalable across quite large and complex organizations. Well, great. Thanks, uh, Lara. That's, uh, that's really interesting to hear about, uh, about the Improve Well app and, and what the possibilities are with it. So um, if we talk a little bit about yourself, you know, your, your career has seen you work in a lot of different kind of capacities across uh, the spectrum or variety of businesses, most of which are relating to healthcare. So just curious how, um, you know, what was the inspiration to set up Improve Prove well. Um, obviously, you're clearly an established entrepreneur now, but uh, you know, in 2016, how did you spot that? Gosh, yes, it, it's been a journey. Um, my background is pharmacology, so I, I've always had a keen interest in science. Um, I wasn't brave enough to apply to study veterinary medicine or medicine at university, so I I went for pharmacology and always had my eye on on medicine, perhaps a career in the NHS, but I found myself having a career in, in biotech, always in the healthcare sector, but helping CFOs and CEOs grow their businesses. Um, and then I thought at the time my forever job was going to be joining a healthcare investment firm and helping them grow their business and also helping the portfolio companies grow their businesses. Um, but actually a school friend of mine, so we've known each other for 25 years, he's a, a full-time um, NHS clinician, Dr. Naeem Ahmed, approached me back in 2014, I think, to get involved in, in a social enterprise that he's been running for, for uh, a decade or more. Um, and this is where he sort of came up with this concept of a, a junior doctor feedback app. Um, because he was seeing 100% of the issues, your frontline workforce are the eyes and ears of the organization, they know what small changes can be sort of made to make tomorrow better. So he said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to build this, this beta product, what do you think? And um, I suppose I've always been very lucky in my career to work with exceptional people, multidisciplinary teams, certainly in biotech, you're, you're bringing novel drugs through that development life cycle through to uh, the market which involves scientists it involves manufacturing it involves all sorts so I really do believe in in bringing people together to drive innovation forward so that combined with Naeem's vision and the NHS it was a no-brainer for me so that was uh, a decision I took in in 2016 to co-found this business and hopefully uh, help the technology reach as many organizations as possible. Fantastic fantastic um 
whenever there's uh, you know a new a new technology trying to get into uh, the NHS and that kind of thing, I imagine is is rather difficult. Um, so, what what are some of those obstacles that you faced along the way in in terms of getting your solution in front of your target audience? This is a great question, and it, the challenges have evolved over the years. So, taking you back to day one. It's very difficult to convince someone to use your product or buy your product when you have no track record, you have no evidence base, you know, why should they go with you versus something else. So one of the things I've spoken to lots of other founders about is, is having, you know, how do you build that track record without customer number one or customer number two? It's very much chicken and egg. Um, we were lucky in the beginning that um, guys in St. Thomas's decided to partner up with us to, to develop the very, ver the very first version of the product which kind of then made it easy to, to work with the second organization um, to say, look, it's been trialed here, here were the learnings, what do you think? Um, and, and so, and we've kind of grown from there. So actually all of the organizations we've worked with over the last four and a half years have all come to us through referrals or, or experiences. And, and we were also very lucky to, to find two more partnerships. So we partnered up um, with an academic health science network called UCL Partners in London, and they helped kind of promote us across the region and then we also partnered up with east london nhs foundation trust to develop uh, functionality so that that all helped in terms of kind of credibility um, word of mouth track record um i suppose the biggest challenge that we see uh, even now is is timing so organizations at various stages of their engagement and improvement journeys do take this really seriously and in taking it really seriously sometimes the the biggest hurdle is oh we're spinning quite a few plates and i'm not sure that the time is now um yeah. which is completely fair enough and and we work with organizations at varying stages of their of their journey in terms of staff engagement and quality improvement or continuous improvement um I guess in the last 12 months in light of the pandemic we've actually had our, our busiest year we've done multiple launches so if people can launch in these conditions you would hope that actually maybe you know now is a good time or there's never a good time let's just go for it let's start small and then grow it from there we're starting to see that philosophy come through now so but certainly I think that's probably been the biggest hurdle is we love the product you know re really great we just don't know if it's the right time to introduce it organization wide or perhaps we'll start in this department so we've had to be flexible um over the years in terms of how we work with our partner organizations yeah and, and, and i think you're right i mean it, it, particularly in in the hospitals i mean there, there's probably never an ideal time they, they no. never downtime so to speak but interesting yeah. that a lot of uh, there's been a lot of uptake during uh, during the time of COVID. So that, yeah, that's really. It has. We've we've been really pleased that we've been in a position to help because I'm sure most businesses of my size, in in February March last year, just thought, oh my goodness, you know, what what does this mean? Does this mean nobody's going to start introducing digital technologies? But what we've seen obviously is a rapid uptake of digital. Um, to support all, all aspects of business operations. So for us, we're, we're delighted to have been able to support organizations um, at such a critical time. Just as a little follow up on that, I mean, I, I can imagine, um, you know, the, the, the frontline staffers who are using the, the app are, are uh, probably quite engaged and they probably really appreciate the fact that they have, a, you know, maybe a, a more significant voice at the, at the table. Um, how, have the, how have the leadership teams reacted to it? I mean, are, are, is there some, has there been resistance to change at all or, or, or are they kind of really buying into it or is it a mixed bag or? Yeah, um, another good question. Um, to be honest, the way that the tool works is we kind of have two stakeholder groups um, in these organizations. We have the frontline users, um, but we have the sort of what we call the group and organizational leads. So um, it's all very well, uh, the frontline giving this feedback, but who, you know, who's processing it? It, it can't really be one person's job. It, it kind of has to be a, a team effort um, between uh, team leads or departmental leads or, or organizational leads responsible for, for improvement and engagement. So, um, to be honest, once an organization buys the software, we don't really get resistance from managers as such. It's not something that's that's forced on them. It's kind of, we have the Improve Our Solution, who wants to start using it in their teams? 
you'll always get teams that immediately want to sign up because because they're ready for it and then they start spreading the word to other teams and then you get kind of multidisciplinary user groups on there to say okay well we're going to have a reducing waste group and we're going to get lots of information to help us tackle reducing waste and you might get a joy in work initiative that that pops up on there so um whether you're using it to help you tackle known challenges or discover unknown challenges um usually there's buy-in from the front line who are just giving you all this information and then and then the people who are kind of committed to taking it forward so it's a it's a great tool for leaders as well if there is any resistance then usually that's just not a place to start and perhaps that might be a, a particular group or, or area of the organization to come you know come back to maybe six months down the line so we do do kind of phased rollouts with our with our programs so with uh, with an organization like the NHS, um, you know, they have uh, obviously a variety of uh, sites uh, across the, the UK. Um, so how, how is it integrated between the hospitals? Can, can teams uh, at, at one site uh, look at the data or, or communicate with the teams at other sites to, you know, kind of give a more holistic view on things or how, do, how does that part work? That, that is the vision. Um, the model at the moment is because it's a secure platform, whoever the licensing organization is, um, licenses the software and then they own the data, um, you know, for their organization. So from a, from a data protection, data ownership point of view, uh, our model is you license the software, you use it for your own organization's improvement. If you want to give that access or, or publish those insights for the benefit of the wider uh, community, then absolutely we can facilitate that. So what we usually do is either work with departments or hospitals or trusts. Most of our customers are trusts. Um, and then you can scale the software and the data insights. So if I was part of a hospital or a, or a trust and I was using it in my, let's say, emergency department, I'd log into the platform and I would only see the data insights that I'm responsible for in my emergency department. But there could be 50 others using it. And then, you know, the, the, the admins or the execs, let's say, would see that organizational view. So if you imagine a, a region licensing the software, you could have the hospitals and the secondary care organizations using it in a certain way, the primary care organizations using it in a certain way, and you could then aggregate those insights at a regional level. So that would be fantastic to, to be able to do that. Um, so we work on a variety of, of local and, and regional programs. Um, we do have multi-account functionality in the app so people can be a member of lots of different programs. Um, so it's, it's very scalable. And what we've done is, is, is try to make it as manageable as possible for people to actually process the information coming in. Because if you imagine opening it up to a region all in one go and just getting all of this information, the dynamics of that program would be very different to a team of 50 using it day in, day out and really weaving it into their daily working practices yeah. um, and being responsible for their own data and discussing their own data. So um, the, the scale and sort of breadth of these programs have slightly different dynamics. Yeah, okay, interesting, interesting. Yeah, we're, we're really, we're trying to encourage sort of bottom up change yeah. without it becoming another day job for people to have to, you know, do all of these things or respond to data. So um, we've tried to make it as flexible as possible to map onto existing processes, but ultimately bring everything together in a central repository for people and then make it easy for them to interpret these trends and, and you know, what's happening. Um, so it's, it's definitely becoming more of a valuable business intelligence, I suppose, uh, data feed combined with other very important uh, data feeds like patient feedback or, you know, other other sort of reporting mechanisms that go on in these organizations already. So what, what do you see as some of the future uh, opportunities or, um, you know, from a product development standpoint for Improve Well? And also I'd be interested to hear, uh, obviously, you, you know, you're really doing a lot of work with the NHS. Do you see uh, other partnerships? Uh, I don't know if you're working with UPA or possibly exporting this to different um, geographical regions, the US, for example, where there's a different uh, healthcare system entirely. So just love to hear a little bit about what the, the future uh, plans for Improve Well are. So we've decided to focus our niche in healthcare. Um, the reason for that is 
we hope that we will make this tool smarter with our aggregated insights. So um, if we're working with lots of emergency departments or maternity departments or renal departments, those, those aggregated data insights we hope can make the tool uh, ever smarter, perhaps spotting ideas that look, you know, look similar or what's trending or, or things like that, which is really helpful to um, leverage that community of organisations that are very similar to each other. And that's kind of happening organically at the moment. Anyway, our customers get in touch with each other and we run a community forum and, and all of that good stuff. So, so that's happening quite organically. Um, the tool itself can absolutely be used in, in any organisation. So there is nothing really healthcare specific about our app and our, and our dashboard. Uh, if anybody wanted to come and use it, they, they could. We do actually have a, a fantastic programme going on in the US. So we are partnered with the uh, University of Minnesota Medical Center. They're two years into their program, seeing really fantastic um, engagement results uh, from their orthopedics department. And uh, so we will definitely be looking to, to expand um, from, from that very nice foundation of a US organization using this tool, as you say, different healthcare system, um, perhaps different challenges. Um, but we would love to be able to unite the global healthcare workforce in terms of organizations benefiting from their own insights from their workforce but also benefiting from um, from insights from others um, we would I suppose from the UK we would uh, we would love to to expand to um, other private care providers that would be fantastic um, we, we do have a keen eye on social care anyone that has a sort of large workforce where um, this tool can really just make it easy to capture real-time data from a large geographically disparate uh, multidisciplinary workforce to ultimately help leaders make better decisions and give better care um, will help to improve services in the region and, and nationally. So um, as a UK business, our heart and, and our passion lies with, with the NHS and, and with the public sector over here. Um, but yes, absolutely, we, we've already had international interest, which has been fantastic to, to see that program go so well overseas. So thanks for sharing everything that you have today, Lara. It's been a really interesting conversation. I guess as we kind of round out the conversation, um, I know that you've had some uh, investment uh, through the Angel Academy, uh, Sarah Turner's organization. And, and uh, interestingly, the last podcast I did was was with Sarah, and it was really interesting to learn about uh, learn about her business and, and the uh, investor community that they've put together. Um, but I'd be really interested in hearing uh, your perspective in terms terms of, um, you know, women in leadership and particularly in entrepreneurial organizations like Improve Well, um, you know, you started this business back in 2016. And how do you think, uh, how do you think things have maybe changed or maybe not changed since then in terms of women being in, in leadership in, in healthcare and uh, maybe in the entrepreneurial space as well? It's an interesting question because I I do feel like things have changed and I was trying to weigh up whether that's because I've proactively plugged myself into these um, female founder networks and now I'm surrounded by inspiring female founders or, or whether there has been a shift and whether there has been a rise in in female founders. And, and I suspect it's, it's probably a combination of both. Um, we are so proud to be working with Angel Academy. And funnily enough, Angel Academy was on my target, you know, my radar uh, in the early days of the company. But um, you have to be established enough to, to be able to sort of get through their uh, investment criteria and kind of get on their radar. So it is fantastic to have their support. And, and we've actually got um, a, a number of female investors now um the first one was in 2018 but I, I mean i've got we've got more than 10 um now which is just excellent and they're so so helpful and everyone's very supportive so i guess me personally i i i feel like i've got a lot of arms wrapped around me you know willing me to to be <laughs> kind of successful um and that includes my customers, my team, you know, we employ a lot of women in the team. So we've never really had anything that's been sort of off balance there. And I do know some fantastic female founders. And I, I think over the last maybe four and a half, five years, we have seen um, 
really strong female role models come through who I think are paving the way for other generations to, to come up and that they've got a track record and they're showing you how it's done. I, I remember when um, GlaxoSmithKline appointed its first female CEO in, in 2017. We've got a lot of female leaders in politics, which has been you know very apparent in the last 12 months as well. So I, I do think there is a change. I think there's more visibility. And, and so for me personally, I, I feel like I've got a huge amount of support. And um, as I say, it's, it's nice to sort of stop and reflect because um, that's certainly been a, a strong element of the, the journey is, is surrounding myself with, with other inspiring um, female founders, but also, you know, just male founders as well. You know, I've met some fantastic people along the way and they face the same challenges that I face. So you know, we, we are in it together, but it, it is good to see um, people wanting more um, women in leadership, um, you know, VCs wanting to back women, uh, women founders. Um, that, that's a welcome uh, sort of focus, I think. Um, and, and even things like Innovate UK have, have, have done awards and, and grants and things for, for female uh, backed businesses. So, all of that is, is, is very, very nice to see and, and nice to see it getting some recognition as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think, there, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's a work in progress, but um, I think we're definitely kind of moving in, in the right direction, which is really, really great to see. So congratulations to you and all the team there at Improve Well and all your successes. And, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody will be really interested in listening to this conversation Thank and you. a little bit more about your business. And yeah, really just uh, wish you a really successful 2021, Mara. Thank you. And you too. It's uh, been a pleasure to be speaking to you today. I really appreciate the opportunity.